Hi, everyone. I'm Helen Levy. I'm one of the associate directors of the Survey Research Center here at ISR. And um, it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the ISR Insights Speaker Series and to introduce today's speaker, Sarah Patterson. Um, Sarah Patterson, uh, Sarah has her PhD in sociology and demography from Penn State. Um, and for the past several years, she's been a research investigator here at the Survey Research Center within ISR where she is doing research on um, families and caregiving um, in the disability the program on the demography of aging disability and care. Um, and she's gonna talk to us today about some research that she's doing that combines a few very uh, interesting threads, including um, caregiving for dementia, which is an increasingly um, pressing concern for a lot of people and how that caregiving is provided in the context of increasingly complex family structures. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Great. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, everyone, for coming today. I know the pizza didn't hurt my cause, but thank you for coming. Um, so I'm Dr. Sarah Patterson, and um, as Helen said, I'm in the Demography of Aging, Disability, and Care program within the SRC, within ISR, within the University of Michigan. It's always funny to talk to students and be like, well, it's a little hard for me to pinpoint where I am. So I usually just say ISR. Um, but I would like to start off by thanking the National Institute on Aging. So this work is funded through a K99 award. Um, so I really appreciate that and um, everyone who sort of helped me along the way. So as Helen said, I'm trained as a family demographer and sociologist. So you'll see in my three concentric circles that I'll talk about caregiving families and dementia, but really families is sort of the kingpin in my research. So we have to sort of set the stage here for the talk. And the first thing we should really think about is the fact that the US population along with the world, right, is aging. So the US census just released some numbers that one in six people in the United States are age 65 and older. This is partly driven by an increase in life expectancy. So this is a projections chart from the, also from the census looking at how life expectancy has increased over time so people are living longer and healthier lives. Obviously, I need to acknowledge that the pandemic probably had an impact on that, right? Estimates have shown that it's either stalled or gone down a little bit. But overall, if we look across decades, we see an increase in the life expectancy, which means that there are more older adults. And this matters because an aging population is associated with an increasing population in need of care. This is just a natural sort of part of aging, right? And estimates show that nearly half of older adults um, had either difficulty or received help in the last month with their daily activities. And this proportion increases naturally with age. Kind of, um, you know, so I have the, the caregiving families and dementia circles, and you'll sort of see it. We do like a clockwise pattern across. Um, and how we're going to talk about this today. So thinking about caregiving um, from a per social, social perspective, um, the General Social Survey has this question in 2012 where they asked who should provide help for daily activities, including like laundry and grocery shopping for an older adult who needs that help. And 75% of Americans said that either the, the family should do the actual help or they should pay to have that help done. So it's really normative and um, sort of understood that families are going to be there to provide care for older adults. You also see this in older adults' perceptions of who will support them as they age. So there's this sort of U-shaped curve, both for family and friends across the life course, where as people age, um, so this is um, from Burgery and Campbell, 2019, you see that they that, oh, I think I can point it with this thing. Let me see if I can do that. <laughs> um, so here with family, as you age, you're more likely to expect that your family will, will provide support for you. There is an increase with time that, ex that people expect their friends as well. But as you can see in that comparison, it's really family who we expect to do this care. It's not only normative for family to provide care, it's what happens in the reality, right? I can see multiple people in this room who provide care for someone in their daily life. Um, so families are at the front line of caregiving uh, for this aging population. And this is important because sometimes family members are the main and sometimes only caregiver for an older adult. 
We know from the broader health literature about families and aging that family composition, which usually focuses on partners and children, which I will talk about as we go through today, the family composition is associated with older adults' health, including their own cognition, their mortality, and their general health patterns. So it's important to think about how family care might be playing into this process. Along with an aging population, we also have to think about population level changes in family structure. So there's a few sort of patterns that are happening that um, have implications for family caregiving. So people are having fewer children overall, as well as having no children. So rising rates of childlessness, um, along with a growing proportion of children who are stepchildren. So stepchildren are usually when somebody partners or marries and brings along their own children, right? Think of, everybody talks about the Brady Bunch, right? That was sort of the um, example for a really long time. There's also changes in terms of partnership at older age. So there are rising rates of late life divorce, also known as gray divorce, as well as remarriage and cohabitation increasing. So taken together, these changes, especially in relation to partners and children, is leading to what has been referred to as kinlessness or not having a partner or children later in life. And so what these are here, are projections from Bergeri and Margolis about um, kinlessness uh, over the next couple of decades. And what you find is that it generally goes up for everyone, but it's different depending on certain characteristics like gender and race. So here, black men and women are expected to have uh, more steep inclines in this um, phenomenon um, that versus white older adults, but white men, for instance, are still have an incline. It's also important to think about natural changes in family structure that go along with just aging, right? So families naturally expand and contract in various ways as you age. So you might be less likely to have a partner the older you get, but you're going to be more likely to have grandchildren if you have children because the chances just increase over time naturally. But who is available also depends on how many people are available. What I mean by that is this um, study by Reyes et al. Um, and, it, you know, there's a lot going on, but here in the first line is if the person, if the older adult has one kid, and you can see that the majority of that is made up by a sibling or a spouse among the population of older adults. But as people have more and more kin, if you go to the right here, you can see that the who's available sort of changes. You get more in-laws, you get more step ties, you get more um, children and parents. So who is available also, or who is available also depends on how many people you have available. But we need to think about the family structure beyond what I call the nuclear beanpole. I didn't know how to combine nuclear families and the beanpole family. So mm -hmm. nuclear beanpole is the best I came up with. It just sounds um, terrible. But um, so we often think about what is called the beanpole, right? So there's this um, sort of up and down lineage. We think of your grandparents or your parents, right? And then your children and your, and your grandchildren. So the people that are above and below you. We also to often talk about the nuclear family, which tends to be in reference to a partner and the children. So this, as I said, is increasingly including stepchildren. But in reality, people have a lot more connections. I always joke that the PSID is a great example of this, right? If you look at the PSID family tree, there's all these different branches to it. People might have aunts and uncles, grandparents-in-law, siblings-in-law, but they also might have family friends who play an important part in their aging process. But it's important to think about how we think about family and the families that we talked about in terms of the nuclear family or the beanpole family, because this does become reflected in policy that's crafted with family structure in mind. But what I mean with that is that if there was a recent study um, by Heyman et al. that looked at access to paid leave and by, across different countries and looked at who was incorporated in the terms of family. It tended to be the nuclear beanpole. It was people who were either their partner 
or their children or parents. Um, and so we have to think about the fact that policies that people have access to, which then translates to public support programs, is crafted with particular families in mind to the exclusion of other types of families and family members. This also translates to the normative expectations we have for families and the help that they provide. So there's a body of work that looks specifically at stepchildren. I mean, I don't know if I can blame the Brady Bunch, but maybe it was just the population change along with the Brady Bunch. That family's got a lot of um, uh, press and research, right? And so we do know more about the fact that it's less normative to expect a stepchild to care for you in older age than to care than a biological child to care for you. And this is reflected in trends of care. So you do see that stepchildren are less likely to help an older adult than biological children. And even a family structure um, that has stepchildren, that older adult, like if their family includes adults, uh, stepchildren are less likely to receive care. Um, but there's less understanding about how other family members uh, in the interplay between these attitudes and care have an effect on what older adults receive in terms of caregiving. So it's also important, right? I'm gonna get to my third circle here. We've talked about caregiving, we've talked about families, but thinking about this in terms of dementia specifically, so Vicki and I, Vicki Friedman and I have a paper that we're working on that compares the National Health and Aging Trend Study and the Panel Study of Income Dynamics estimates for older adults' family structures um, by dementia status of the older adult. And we find that although the number of family members is similar uh, between older adults with and without dementia, we do find a pretty consistent pattern that I think for the rest of the research agrees with that older adults with dementia are less likely to be partnered. So it's important to think about how this plays into who's available to care. There's also work from Parker and Fabius that looks at this um, among Black and Hispanic older adults in comparison to white older adults. And they also find that um, there's a lower likelihood of being married. There's also a, like, a higher likelihood of living alone which has an impact on your care availability. But Black and Hispanic older adults relative to white older adults are more likely to report living with other people who are not their spouse, as well as having more household family members. So there's different dynamics here going on um, for older adults. And then LGBT older adults in self-reports of the caregiving that they receive are less likely to report having children available to care and more likely to report having a partner or friends to provide care for them as they age. So family structure has an effect on who's available. But I want to sort of step back really quick and talk about dementia um, specifically because dementia is actually an umbrella term that is associated with things like a decline in memory, changes in thinking skills, poor judgment and reasoning, decreased focus and attention, and changes in language and behavior. But under the umbrella, as they call it, of dementia, there are different forms of dementia. So we have Alzheimer's, which I think most people have probably heard that name, that term, right? There's the Alzheimer's Association, we hear about Alzheimer's as a form of dementia quite often, but there are other forms as well. So there's vascular, there's Lewy body dementia, which um, the late Robin Williams, the actor, had that, was diagnosed with that. Um, and then frontotemporal dementia, which has recently been in the news because actor Bruce Willis was diagnosed with this and his family has been pretty vocal of talking about it. So when you hear someone talk about dementia, think about it as an umbrella, uh, under which these other um, diseases fall. But they all are associated with these symptoms in terms of memory, thinking, judgment, and behavior and language. This matters because if we take it in context of an overall aging population, as Helen sort of mentioned, this means that there are more older adults that potentially have dementia 
So this um, set of estimates that used the health and retirement study found that in six, uh, 2016, 6.5 million older adults had dementia. And if you project this into the future with no changes, everything stable as it is, it's projected to be about 11.7 million by 2040. So although the percentage of the population will stay in similar size, the number of older adults who have this will increase. We also have to think about this from a population perspective. Dementia is unevenly distributed across different populations. So for instance, Hispanic and Black older adults are more likely to have dementia or mild cognitive impairment, which is sort of a precursor to dementia. Having lower educational attainment is associated with higher risk of dementia and sexual or gender minority adult older adults have a higher prevalence of dementia as well. So different older adults are at different risk. This is important in the larger context of dementia because if you've seen sort of, you know, there's a drug that comes out, I won't even try to pronounce these drug names. Um, you know, there was a drug that will come out and people will become really hopeful and it goes to the FDA and there's all this talk around it. That's important, but right now there is currently no treatment for dementia, which means the need for care is guaranteed, right? And it's important to think about it in terms of dementia specifically as a disease because it's progressive. So for the person, it also gets worse over time. So how does this translate to care specifically in terms of older adults with dementia? Estimates show, and they're pretty stable, that one in 10 older adults have dementia. We find this in NHATS, the National Health and Aging Trend Study, in HRS, the Health and Retirement Study. But this population of older adults with dementia comprise about a third of the family care, era, care hours that are provided to older adults on average. So although they are a smaller population relatively, again, because of the progressive nature of the disease, they receive a lot of care. Older adults with dementia also have larger care networks than older adults without dementia. And this is sort of what I'm tackling in terms of like, who is in that network, right? So we know they're less likely to be partnered. So who are these people that rally around the older adult? And then from a larger sign, kind of zooming back out and thinking about um, norms and obligations, dementia is generally pretty stigmatized. I think if you hear anybody describe it, it's generally pretty negative, right? In terms of what it means um, and the experience for people who are living with it, as well as their caregivers. But there's less understanding of what's known as kin scripts from Stack and Burton, which is the work that we provide within families in relation to the timing and the life course and those expectations within family units in relation to dementia as a disease within the family. So I think when I go through all of this and kind of zoom back out and say, like, what is left to answer, right? I think it's still unresolved about who is considered family. This comes up a lot. Even the term family can be limiting. When you ask people who their family are, they might refer to the biological tie only or the legal ties or the tie that they talk to, right? Family estrangement is a huge issue. So who is considered family? And then care is normative, but I would ask for which family member specifically. A lot of the national level of surveys, especially on attitudes, just ask about the family. They don't ask about particular family members, which is what I'm interested in. And then what impact does dementia have on all of these processes in thinking about caregiving and aging? So that leads me to my current work, which I'm excited to talk to you about. Like I said, this is funded by the National Institute on Aging. I'm incredibly grateful for this funding. The overall objective of my project is to enhance understanding and measurement of these family and kinship ties, as well as caregiving norms and behaviors in order to better understand under what circumstances certain family and kinship ties become what, what I would call activated, right? And how this process differs when the older adult has Alzheimer's disease and related dementias versus when they do not. So my approach has basically like four prongs to it. Um, 
And I'm going to focus on the focus groups today, but I just wanted to tell you about the other work that's happening around this project. So there's secondary data analysis. Like I said, um, I've been using the National Health and Aging Trend Study and the Panel Study of Income Dynamics to look at family structure of older adults by dementia. We've got these focus groups that happened uh, recently, this just super recently, just a couple months last month. Um, and then the next step will be sort of doing cognitive interviews with the items that we develop and then fielding a web survey eventually. So this is like the as a demographer, this has been so fun to me because quotes are like the best thing ever to use, right? So it's so fun to be like, okay, I can talk about people's lived experiences and here you go. Like, here's what someone said to me. So I'd like to thank Margaret and Olivia. Margaret works at SRO and Olivia is my undergrad research um, assistant um, for helping to do these focus groups this summer. But this was one of the quotes from the, one of the focus groups. And I like it because the person said, Family, when we asked them about families, right, they said families are messy, aren't they? Especially this one in reference to their own family. And I think, you know, people are nodding and smiling. I know you guys have messy families out here, right? Self included. So this is uh, a quote that I just think totally captures uh, what I found. So just to give you an overview of the focus groups, we had two focus groups. They were fielded on July 30th and August 2nd. We did record, everybody was had an informed consent um, and no names are associated with those audio recordings, but that's just so that we can later do some analysis. We um, targeted basically eight to 10 caregivers per focus group. We had about six to seven for each group um, attend. They were an hour and a half each, which, you know, when you look at it, when I, at least when I look at an hour and a half, I think that is a long time, but it really is not, it flies by. I could have asked 10 million more questions, right? But an hour and a half each, and we paid people $65 for their time. When we were thinking about our focus groups and recruitment, we referenced national population statistics <coughs> on caregivers in terms of um, distribution by gender, sexual orientation, and race and ethnicity. So our recruitment strategy um, was really informed by people's experiences in ISR, um, the PET, the participant, and hey, I enhanced, no, wait, participant engagement team. Thank you. I was like, I have it later in the slide because I can, so many acronyms, right, around ISR. Um, so uh, really sort of helped um, get that together. I would say that we are super grateful to Mishar. I cannot even try to explain what that acronym means, but um, they have the U of M Health Research Registry. We found this a really good tool for recruiting would highly recommend it to anyone on campus who's doing this kind of research. Um, we also had flyers that Olivia put together for us that we posted and emailed um, to different um, groups. So the first one we did is uh, we corresponded with the libraries around Ann Arbor. That was really fun because I don't know about you, but I go to the library and I was like, there it is, there's my poster. <laughs> um, among a lot of posters, right, it's Ann Arbor. So, uh, it was great to see it though in the wild. Um, and then local groups, especially uh, the YMCA, local community groups of caregivers for older adults. So we did send out our information um, to try to go beyond the health research registry. It's important to um, kind of explain, as you can see, this is our flyer, like I said, and uh, the, the way we tried to catch people is to ask if they help someone who is age 65 or older and has trouble remembering. And so I know I've been saying caregiving, I've been using the term caregiving, right? And I've been using the term dementia, but one of the, there's a few different aspects about why we use health instead of care. Um, the first thing is, is that some people would not classify themselves as a caregiver, but I might as a researcher, or you might, if you looked at what they did for people, right? So if I, we thought, if we said, you care for someone, people might be like, no, that's just what I do for my mom, or that's what I just do for my family, right? So we emphasize help. And this came out in our interviews as well. And then we focus on trouble remembering, because just as there are unequal distributions of dementia among different subpopulations, there are also unequal distributions of who gets diagnosed formally with dementia, right? So these are all critical for making sure that we captured people who were of interest to us, but who were not being um, excluded because of other systematic um, exclusion. 
So they had to be 18 or older, right? Um, they had to help someone who is age 65 or older, had trouble remembering. And then we also excluded anybody who provided this kind of help for a job or work. So we were really interested in capturing family and unpaid caregivers. So I won't go into the nitty gritty of the demographics, but we ended up screening about 24 people. I'll say we actually had to turn off our ad on the U of M Health Research Registry. We got such a positive response, which I'm forever grateful to the community for. People wanted to participate. Um, and then among people who attended, they tended to be middle, well, I would consider middle age, 53, right? And we had a good distribution um, otherwise. People were mainly, the people that we ended up um, getting to come in were mainly caring for a parent, about 70% of them. And then the other 30%, for caregiving for other family members. And some of the people we screened, we did have about 8% of the people we screened were caregiving for a friend. And I'll talk about that later in terms of my next steps, but that's a group that I'm really interested in talking to more. So I won't tell you exactly what we um, asked them, uh, just in case we feel more focused groups, but um, just broadly overview, the main questions here the main ideas that we were trying to get at is who is considered family, right? We asked them about biological ties, but people beyond that. Um, and then um, who among the family is considered a caregiver? And then who um, should be expected to care among that list of people? So what you see here is our uh, roster that we gave people. Um, and we asked them to list family members. And then we talked about those family members in terms of caregiving, as well as expectations. So these are preliminary themes that we pulled out after each focus group, we would sit down, Margaret, Olivia and I, and we would sort of debrief about what we heard people talking about. And so these are really pulling from those notes and the next step will be to do more in-depth qualitative analyses on these focus group transcripts. So the first one in terms of family ties, we saw that people talked about the flexibility of ties as well as the um, sort of um, necessary inclusion of traditional ties. So that's again, like where you ask who's in your family and people might default to um, biological ties, for instance. So this is a adult child caregiver. And they said, you know, when they were writing down the family members, I put people down who are on the family tree, even if they're not super close with my mom. I mean, they're in her life. They fall under the category of family, right? So uh, a super enthusiastic <laughs> um, endorsement of those family members, but they said they're on my family tree. So people do think about it in this sort of traditional way. Another adult child speaking of what she referred to as an adopted aunt in their family, she said she's not a relationship, but she might as well be because it takes a village, right? In terms of caregiving for her mom. We also have family dynamics that pop up uh, when we talk about family and caregiving. One of the things is that it's not just the relationship. So if you remember from the grid, let me go back successfully. Yeah, if you remember from the grid, so we asked people to give an initial or a first name. And then we said, you know, what's the relationship of that person to the older adult? And then we also asked, what's the relationship of that person to you, right? Because they're the caregiver. So they have a relationship with that family member in some way or form. And this came up um, when we talked about the ties between family members influencing the care dynamics. So this partner, uh, speaking about the adult children, said they use me as an excuse for the reason why they don't help, right? So that's not a dynamic with their mom. It's a dynamic with the, the partner. This was also an interesting case um, where the partner said, my kids are fairly helpful. But she said, I think they're helping my husband because they're helping me, right? They want to help. They're doing it for me versus for my husband. But they help the husband through helping their mom. Another thing that came up, and this was a really fascinating thing that we sort of did not perceive that happened in both groups, 
is that when we ask people like what makes a caregiver, what are the tasks that in, are included in caregiver, both groups, like without pause, were like, well, you tell me, what does it include, right? We didn't expect that. But again, I think that that ties into, you know, people might not identify themselves as caregiving. And we found that people talked about as they sort of went through the group that things like emotional support or caregiving, um, like from an emotional perspective, excuse me, were seen as caregiving. Um, and often this happened through distance. So I talk about distance here, but this ties into what we found about emotional caregiving and, and social supports. So for instance, an adult child was talking about a really important friend of their mother's and they said, distance doesn't really matter because my mom's best friend knows all of her business, right? She said she was connected to her, but the distance that they had between them didn't matter because she was providing that social support regardless. There's not a quote for it, but there was another participant who talked about how sometimes she has her mom show her what medicine that she's taken on the phone, right? She lives in town. She goes over there frequently, but sometimes she can't make it. She has to go to work. So she calls her mom and asks her to show her on the phone, right? So people are doing caregiving in ways that might mean that they're not in the room with the person. There was also an adult child speaking on providing emotional support from afar who said that she called by WhatsApp video call every day. So video calls did kind of come out as an important aspect of caregiving. So that she was saying that that's the way she keeps in touch with her parents. That's how she provides for them because the brother is the one who's there in person. Care capacity and expectations. So when we talked about caregiving, people talked a lot about the capacity to care, right? The words patience, love, trust came up. Um, this adult child said, never, and that, you know, I never bothered concerning myself with it because I was just seeing the person who could take care of everything, that they had the capacity, people knew that they had the patience, the love, the trust, so they were able to do it. In relation to family, this came up because people would be like, well, maybe that we think that that person should do it but they don't have the capacity, so we don't ask them to, right? So people were negotiating these between family members as well. In terms of expectations and reality, we saw that this mattered based on people's own um, lives. So this niece was providing care, and she said, you know, if other people say, if I say, you can't, I can't do something, other people are like, I don't know why not, you don't have kids, right? So people's own family structure influenced the expectations other people had for them. I, my first poster at PAA was about that general social survey question about families who should provide care. And I'll never forget, I wish I had <laughs> registered this person's name, but they pointed and they said, that's daughters. That's who these people are talking about, right? That's single daughters. So people have these sort of like expectations and um, roles in their mind about who should be providing this. We also had an extended family caregiver, speaking of the person's adult child, said, you know, I don't think this is my job. I think it's his job, right? So there is sort of these expectations, but then the realities of what sort of pans out at the end of the day in terms of who's actually doing it. And the fascinating thing about focus groups is like versus an interview is people can respond to the conversations that came up, right? And this was a really fascinating one because somebody immediately cut in and said, if you weren't there, you'd have to pay someone to do it. So thinking about the realities of when care families don't provide or don't, are not able to provide care for an older adult. And then finally, on the theme of dementia and how that changes. So we asked people, you know, how dementia um, changes these dynamics. So it changes caregivers themselves. So this adult child, speaking of their father, who was caring for their mother said, if you knew my dad, that was not the dad I grew up with, right? Providing care for his partner changed this person. You also have dynamics between the family members and the older adult with dementia specifically. This was a really powerful story that someone in our group shared. And she said, they have very bad memories of their father. So now that his, he has dementia and his behaviors have changed back to the way he used to be, that brings back these old memories, but he doesn't remember the trauma that he's created, right? So he's not living in the same experience as the children in the family. 
but people do see dementia as positive in some aspects. So again, we had an extended family caregiver who was speaking about the lack of care being provided by the family. And she said that the person she cares for doesn't remember any of it. So yeah, there's a positive to dementia basically. So just to summarize our preliminary results, right? Family ties and dynamics matter. Families do have an impact on each other. And we saw that sort of, in, if we think about the family units, care can be provided from a distance, right? And that means that there's a range of care that people provide, including emotional and social support. Care capacity in terms of people's own capacity to provide it came up, as well as expectations and the realities of those expectations um, for caregiving for an older adult. And then we did see an impact in terms of how dementia changes that dynamic, especially. So just to sort of summarize, and you know, it's always good to be hopeful about next steps. So uh, my next steps um, is that we're hoping to focus, have more focus groups. And I sort of mentioned it in, the, in a few different places throughout the presentation, but there were particular populations of caregivers that I wish we had better access to that we're hoping to in the next sort of stage is that for instance, young caregivers, so caregivers who are age 18 to 24, um, you know, I, they um, historically don't get a lot of um, research done on them because surveys of uh, young adults don't really ask about caregiving responsibilities. I would say to do now, like, I feel like, you know, that has really changed, um, but it would be great to be able to talk to a group of young caregivers. We're also hoping to talk to more LGBTQ plus caregivers in terms of their experiences, extended family caregivers, as the one example extended family caregiver we had, um, you know, that really changes the dynamics when you're sort of like one step removed from the more nuclear beam pole as it is. Um, and then friend and voluntary kin caregivers. Um, so these are, those are my hopes and dreams. <laughs> and what will happen next then is that we'll use this material to develop a survey, a set of survey items from the focus group things in terms of how people think about caregiving, the norms and expectations they have for people, and then what the care actually looks like. This will include some cognitive interviews and further survey development where we have people, you know, look at our items and then tell us how bad they are, I guess. Is that, no, that's not really what happens. Um, but uh, yeah, so cognitive interviews where we ask people like, okay, so we said family, like what does family mean to you, right? Um, so sur developing those survey items through cognitive interviews. And through those, and in thinking about the larger survey that will be developed, again, I'm a family demographer. It's going to be about family, right? Like that's what it's going to be about family structure and family, the expectations and care, and then thinking about dementia as um, an aspect of, the, of what um, people are the people that people are providing care for. So I really loved that one of our participants, this is one of our participants, right? She was talking about people who are connected and she said, it takes a village, right? So I would like to end today by thanking my village. Um, so I would, I am incredibly grateful to the study participants who went out of their way to come to ISR and talk to us about these important aspects. The National Institute on Aging, um, my mentors and Jana Dietrich in our office, uh, MICTA and the Demography of Family Care Network, Caregiving Network, excuse me, the ISR PET, the participant engagement team, who was honestly super critical in helping me develop my uh, focus groups. And if you're thinking about developing any kind of studies, I would encourage you to attend one of their meetings. Margaret Hudson from SRO, who helped facilitate um, our, our focus groups. Europe is the undergraduate research opportunity program. So Olivia was really critical in helping with the focus groups this summer, to design our posters, help with the informed consent. And then Sammy and Faith are my new students this uh, year, semester, um, along with Olivia has stayed on to help, as well as my own family, my own friends. Um, I appreciate everyone's support and a ton of people along the way. We started to keep an acknowledgement list and it just gets longer and longer and longer. And I think that that's the truth behind research, right? It's 
Um, it does take a lot of people and it takes a village. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Patterson, you're willing to take uh, questions from the audience, right? Yeah. Come around with the microphone. So, if anyone would like to raise their hand. <laughs> Hello, awesome presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my question had to do with with the broadening of folk who are part of the family of care. Were there any discussions and focus groups about um, authority to get seek health care or medical attention? Right. So that I don't think came up a lot in the way people were thinking, but kind of targeting back to the point about how policy is crafted with family in mind, right? This is when it kind of the rubber hits the road in terms of how we define family. I always think about like the most extreme case, like being able to visit someone in the emergency department will depend on who you are in relation to them, right? Um, but we didn't see, not that I can remember, to be honest, um, uh, participants really sort of getting into that kind of nitty gritty. Thank you. I think the next one was back here. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, did you come across any issue regarding family alienation and the impact that might have in terms of uh, um, uh, impacting on, on, on getting into the caretaking role? Let's say if there was an alienation, dementia sets in, how does that change that relationship? Yeah, that's a great question. So like alienation and estrangement did come up um, in various ways. So we had the one person um, at least in, in, re in relation to dementia specifically, right, that their father was not, like, they were estranged from their father, but because he was ailing, they wanted to be more involved, but they were struggling with that, at least from the, the, the experience of the partner who was caregiving. So it kind of came up in that way. And then we also had a really fascinating experience where um, when we asked about who was in the family, we had one person say, there's no one no one in this family. But as they started talking, children popped up, right? So they were probably dealing with estrangement from those children. Um, and in their mind, they weren't a part of their family anymore. So it's a great question. Thank you. Hi, um, I'd be interested in research on how caregivers and family members make decisions um, about putting someone with dementia into more care mm -hmm. and dealing with partners who doesn't want to, that kind of thing, when to step in, how to step in when you're in different parts of the country. Right, that. yeah. So that's a, that's a great um, question in terms of how people manage these dynamics when perhaps you put someone into a nursing home, right? Because there is no one. Um, I, I think back to the um, extended family caregiver who the, you know, everybody else in the group responded, like, if you don't do this, you're gonna have to pay to have somebody do this, right? So there does become a point where if no one's available, other options have to come up. Um, I think that's a great question and something that we didn't really get into uh, with this. Um, and then also something to consider is that most of these people were caring for the older adult within the community or even their own homes. Um, so we didn't see a lot of people who um, were doing like paid care um, or having the older adult um, live in a, a nursing home. But that's a great question and something that I think is yet unresolved. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, as you mentioned, Dementia is a progressive disease right. that occurs over time. Right. And I would suggest that many people, at least in the early stages, know they have dementia and are open to help. Well, there are others that are in denial. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference associated with the caregiving of those two groups? Yeah, that is a great question that I don't have a direct response to, but just to speak to it in general, um, 
this comes up a lot in research on dementia because as you mentioned in the early stages people are still able to participate um the national institute of aging had a really great um, seminar series where they invited people with dementia right but it all tends to be early stage because they can still sort of um, participate in those things but that's sort of part of what i'm interested in figuring out long term is how these family dynamics change as a person um, ages and ages with dementia, perhaps, because I think, um, you know, I, I've heard other people and perhaps in my own life, I won't um, throw anyone under the bus here, but, you know, as they're aging, they might have difficulty, like you said, being honest about what that means in terms of the limitations, um, and that does change family dynamics. So I guess my roundabout answer, sorry, but I don't have a good answer for you right now, but I hope to, um, that is really definitely something I'm interested in getting out with this um, project long term. So thank you for that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Start here. Um, so um, I just, I don't know if you have this data, but this is a great project and thank you for sharing it. It was really great to hear um, about a caregiver health and declines and like how the stress of caregiving can weather or wear on people who are, who are participating in caregiving. Is that maybe something you're thinking about? Or? Right, yeah. So um, this is a really important question. And I know that there's actually some people in the audience. So I'm gonna point to Kara, um, working on sort of like care dyads and the impact on the person who care gives. I think this is really important to think about because, you know, the, the way my sample is set up, the person who's being given care has dementia or memory issues. But I think one of the um, things that we have to move away from in the literature is that people with disabilities themselves can be caregivers, right? So, for instance, uh, with the IRB, people with dementia would be considered a vulnerable population, rightly so. So there's less research done with them. But there, it's important to think about, sorry, sort of going around and thinking about your question as well in terms of the progression of the disease. Um, it's important to think about how these families function and then how the effect has on someone's own aging process. So for instance, we have the extended family caregiver um that provided a lot of care you know she she said like i don't have this quote here but i think she was like i'm 83 like i have my own problems right like i have my own aging process that i need to deal with um so i don't have a good answer for you and it's not a part of this project but i do think it's an important piece of the puzzle yeah great talk i have two questions yeah. so my first question is did you hear any caregivers discuss um, maybe reluctancy to be a caregiver given the situation. And then my second question is around, there's technically no caregiving 101 course that someone could take. Right. And so I was wondering, did any of the participants talk about seeking resources and especially those who are caring for older adults with dementia, because this might be a new kind of, you know, I guess a new uh, experience for them because they might've been a caregiver for, for someone else with a different type of illness or disease. Right. Yeah. So in terms of reluctance to care, I think just based on the sample I had, right, it was people who were providing care who, who were pretty had pretty strong opinions and experiences with that. But they talked about other people, other family members who were reluctant to care um, and to provide care. Um, and so that did come up in sort of a roundabout way. But that's a really important um, question to think about going forward. And then in terms of remember your question, but hold on. Caregiving 101, thank you. I was like, um, Caregiving 101 was interesting because I think, um, so from so from the ISR PET, the participant engagement, as well as looking at other people who are doing research in this area, it was really important for us to also provide resources to the participants. So like we put together an information sheet for people who participated in our group. Um, it was just an informal sort of document. We're like, you know, this is not the end all be all, but here are some places to start if you're curious. And I felt like that was a really important piece of the project. Um, but also when we asked people at the very end, you know, what they had thought about the focus group and what was like the most important thing they took away, 
we did have quite a few people that mentioned being able to talk to other people in a similar situation and not feeling so isolated and alone in their experience. So like you said, it's like they might not be able to reach out or not know how to. I think part of that is tied to like the, the stigma around dementia in general, but also just, you know, people are busy. I mean, that was one of the things thinking about um, recruiting, right? If you're caregiving, you're caregiving for someone who has progressive care needs, you know, maybe you don't have an hour and a half. Like I said, I'd love to talk to them longer, but like maybe the hour and a half is like the max you could, you know, get into your schedule. Um, so I, I always think about that in terms of getting resources to those people is that they, you know, it might be, they don't have the energy and the time at the end of the day to go seeking those. But I think that that's an important thing to think about. So thank you. Thank you. I have two questions. Yeah, no worries. So, yeah. Enjoyed your talk today. Thank you. And um, I had a question like in regards to like, there's new developments with medicine, but is there any um, cognitive exercises that are good for those that have dementia? And do you find that those who care for them tend to think that they start to develop symptoms on dementia? All right. You know, how they relate or how's that affected the family? Yeah. So. It's interesting to, to think about because there is no, you know, pill that you can take basically um, to cure it, to cure dementia, what people can do otherwise. And I would say, um, I can't remember in our focus groups to be fully honest, but like from the larger research, one of the things people do is to keep the older adult integrated into their daily life, into social activities. So not just, um, you know, like if, if they go to church or if they go to an organization, like including the person who has dementia. And I know that some programs um, for caregivers will allow you to bring the older adult with dementia. So it sort of becomes like a group atmosphere. But um, in terms of activities, um, I wish some of the medical people on my <laughs> mentorship um, committee were here because um, they didn't get into that a lot, but I saw that people did it in a social, like you can see people doing it in a sort of social way in terms of keeping the person integrated into everyday life, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what? Sure. Yeah, because I find my mother-in-law, she's 75 with dementia, and she stays with us like maybe eight, six to eight months out the year, and then she lives in Maryland with some other of her other children. But we find like... Um, she had a hard time remembering the day of the week. So we said, well, if you went to church yesterday, then what is today? And then she kind of worked around to, oh, it's Monday. Or um, she loved Jeopardy. And it's amazing to see how many questions she answered. <laughs> but just to say what she did last five minutes ago, she can't remember. Right. So I'm just really curious, like, is there anything that we can do to the minds and muscle? Can you work it, you know, to retain some things mm -hmm. a little better so. yeah thank you uh i think we have time for one more question uh were there yep okay there is one over here okay maybe then two okay yeah just a quick uh, note um kind of segue to his comment about uh, his mother cultural groups certain ethnic groups are known for um having an aging parent live with them uh, and, and I don't know if that was something that came up in your work. And also, um, conversely, they would be less inclined to reach out for outside social support or medical uh, yeah. support at the same time. Yeah, so, we sort of, our participants were a mix of people yeah. who lived with the person and then the, the person lived on their own. But co-residence is a really important aspect. And then in terms of reluctance to include other people, I'm thinking of one participant who it was interesting because they really said like the family should do this, but as they started to talk about their story, it was really the neighbor who discovered that the person was having cognitive decline. So yeah, so they felt like we're, we're the people who need to take care, but really this neighbor was sort of out there doing it um, as well. So that's a great point, co-residents and sort of larger community. Yeah, and then final question over here. Great. Thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. I had two questions. First one is covered <laughs> in the last question. So mm -hmm. we can go with the second one. Um, with respect to support, we can 
classify support as different types, for example, emotional, instrumental, social, etc. So did anything uh, regarding this, the type of support come up in the discussions uh, you could? Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, the type definitely came up um, in, in terms of, especially with that aspect of distance. So that's where people are like, oh yeah, providing emotional support and calling your person every day is an important aspect of caring. So it came up in that way. Now, what was your other question? Yeah, the, the other one was regarding this intergenerational household patterns, which was covered in the last question as to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a co-residence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. I really appreciate it. Yeah.